where we see our sin, where no one else can see it, but God sees it. When we think of these things from today, can we really say that humanity is better today than it was in Genesis 6? And the big question is, if God brought a flood to judge the whole earth for people's sin and violence, and there's still great sin and violence that infects the whole world today, shouldn't that mean another flood is waiting for us? Doesn't that mean another flood is on the verge of coming to sweep the whole earth again? And I, I've talked with some of you where you're afraid, you feel like maybe the world is coming to an end and it feels like God's judgment. You know, it wouldn't be wrong for God to send another flood as judgment. And that thought that God could send another flood, it should scare us. It should scare us because we have not learned our lesson since the time of Noah. You know, the temptation is to think that the Old Testament is from a time that is irrelevant or too far removed from today. But if the Holy Spirit is softening your heart to the word of God this morning, you know that the God of Noah's day is the same God of today. God was holy, righteous, and just back then. And he is holy, righteous, and just right now. So the question isn't, will he send another flood? The right question we should be asking is, why hasn't he sent another flood? Why are we still alive? The reason God hasn't sent another flood isn't because we're great and isn't because we're better than people from Noah's day. The reason God hasn't sent another flood isn't because he doesn't notice what we're doing. It's not because he's blind to the hard things that are going on in this world. The reason God hasn't sent another flood is because of a covenant he made with Noah after the flood. And you might be wondering, what is the covenant that God made with Noah? Well, today we'll be learning about this covenant and through examining this covenant, we're gonna see two things that will serve as the outline for our sermon today. If you're taking notes, these are the two things that God's covenant to Noah reveals to us. Number one, it reveals to us the heart of people. The heart of people. And the second thing it reveals to us is the heart of God. The covenant that God makes to Noah reveals to us the heart of God. Please turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter nine, verses one through 17. Last week we went over the end of Genesis chapter eight, but today we'll begin in Genesis chapter nine. And if you're there, I would like to invite you to stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's word. And if you notice someone next to you doesn't have a Bible, please share with them and encourage them to bring their Bible next time. We stand as a sign that we revere God's word, that we treasure it, and that this morning we're not hearing from just a man, but we're hearing from God himself. This is the reading of God's word. Genesis chapter nine, verse one. We'll read all the way to verse 17. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as they gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Verse six, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man 
in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, we saw how committed God is to his creation. We saw this because God renewed his blessing to creation through Noah. And I say the word renew or make new because God gives Noah the same blessing that he gave to Adam when he first created people. Here in verses one through seven, we see that it contains similar language and themes of when God blessed creation for the first time through Adam. If you look down at verse one, it says God blessed Noah and his sons. And then if you make your way down to verse seven, God tells them, and you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's because God told Adam the same thing in Genesis 1, 28. But if you noticed as we read, the blessing God gives to Noah has some key differences from the blessing he initially gave to Adam. We'll look at the differences shortly, but why are the differences even there? And this brings us to our first point, the heart of people, the heart of people. The reason the blessing to Noah is different is because the heart of people is now filled with sin. When Adam created people, people were good, people were sinless. But once Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, it guaranteed that the hearts of all people who would come after them would be filled with sin. No one is born good after Adam and Eve. And you would think that after something as great as the flood, people would get it together. You would think that once God wipes out all of creation except for one family and they get a fresh start, they would get it right. But the fact that the blessing to Adam is different from the blessing to Noah reminds us that even though the flood provided creation with a fresh start, it didn't have power to give people a new heart. It brought judgment, but not salvation. So what are these differences? What are these differences? If you look closely at the first seven verses of our passage, we're gonna walk through three differences between the blessing to Adam and the blessing to Noah. And these three differences show how sin has infected the heart of people. And these differences reveal the devastating consequences and effects of sin, especially when it comes to the heart of people. The first difference is in verse two. If you look down at verse two, God, he reaffirms the dominion of man over the rest of creation. The similarity here is that Adam was also given dominion over the rest of creation. People were the pinnacle of God's creation. 
They were called to steward everything else. But that's where the similarity ends. Because of sin, the dominion that Noah has over the animals and the order of creation, it no longer comes through love and kindness. Instead, his dominion comes through fear. God tells Noah in verse two that the fear of him, the dread of him will be on every beast of the earth. Order on the earth is no longer kept through love. It's kept through fear. It's kept through threats. It's kept in that way because of sin. The second difference is in verse three. God declares animals as food for people but prohibits eating blood. The author of Genesis doesn't say why God allows for animal consumption and maybe it has something to do with the fall but what should draw more of our attention is the restriction that God makes. Look down at verse four. In verse four, God says, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is, its blood. That's weird. God says it's okay to eat animals, but not the blood. Why not the blood? If you look at Leviticus 17, you'll see that blood was reserved for atoning sacrifices or sacrifices that took the place of sinful people. In Old Testament Israel, when you sinned, you were required to give an animal sacrifice in faith that it is sufficient to take your place of punishment. In Leviticus 17 verse 11, God says that it's the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And even though not in Noah's day, eventually in the biblical narrative, God would reveal that sin offerings had to be made to atone for the sin in people's hearts. There has to be payment for our sin. And God used animal offerings in the Old Testament to show the Israelites that the punishment for sin is costly. Sin isn't free. It leads to death. And from here in Genesis, God was already communicating hints of this in his prohibition of animal blood consumption. People could eat an animal, but not its blood because of sin. The third difference is in verses five and six. God establishes a consequence for murder. After the fall in Genesis three, in Genesis four, we saw that Cain murdered his brother Abel. In Genesis six, it said violence filled the hearts of men. The reason God brought the flood was because of people's uncontained sin, which led to the taking of one another's lives. When God created Adam, everything was good. There was no sin. So he didn't have to tell Adam not to kill anyone. But after the flood, God didn't want to judge the world for its violence again. So he is warning people to not murder, basing the command in the foundational truth that everyone is made in God's image. And so to murder someone is to destroy what God created. Now, the only reason that God gives this command is because he knows people are still capable of killing other people. If people's hearts were changed after the flood, he wouldn't need to give this command. But in verses one to seven, God renewed his blessing to creation through Noah, but there were differences from the one he gave to Adam. And it reveals the heart of people, that the heart is sick with sin. You know, God sending the flood because of sin, but saving humanity through Noah, and then humanity not really changing much because people's hearts are still sinful, which include us today. It's kind of like if a murderer was being tried in court and that murderer was sentenced to the death penalty. And as they were on their way to death, the judge removed the death penalty in the last second and they let them go free. And then that person murders someone else again. That's, that's almost what it's like. And at a certain point, there comes a time where the judge will not remove the death penalty because it's a threat to everyone else. The murderer will get what he deserves. And we saw 
that God's blessing to Noah shows that people's hearts are still sinful, we haven't learned our lesson, and we still deserve judgment. And we know from experience that we're sinful. Then does that mean at a certain point, God will have to give us what we deserve? After all, don't we all sin? And don't we keep on sinning? Don't we come to ask for forgiveness over and over again, but sin over and over again? Or maybe we don't even, we're not even there anymore. We don't care anymore. And we believe what's in the point if we're not really changing? And what's to say that we have only one more shot before the flood of God's judgment sweeps over our lives? And this brings us to our second and final point the heart of God. Why hasn't another flood come? Why hasn't God rightly judged you and me and the rest of creation since the time of Noah? It's because he's restraining himself and we see this in the covenant he makes with Noah. While we're laughing and playing and distracting ourselves with entertainment, God is restraining himself from judging us. And that's what we see in the covenant with Noah. After renewing his blessing, God immediately established a covenant with Noah. And in the covenant, God makes a promise to Noah. What is the promise? Here's the promise. God promised to never destroy all of creation again. Look down at verse 11. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God is saying, I know I judge the world by bringing a flood. And I know it would be right for me to do it again. And I know that even after seeing the horrors of the flood, you have not learned your lesson because there is still sin in your hearts. And I know all these things, but still, I will never do it again. Friends, this is a great promise. Consider what this communicates about the heart of God. What do you see about the heart of God here? Does he not care about you? Is he angry or frustrated? Or is he patient? Is he merciful? Does he endure our sins? God brought the flood because people were bad. But he's saying no matter how bad we get, and no matter how bad it gets again, he's never going to wipe us out in the way he did in Genesis 7 and 8. Some suggest maybe God didn't know how bad humanity would get again. Maybe he had the hope that things would be different going forward. After all, seeing a flood like that and telling stories about that generation to generation, it should wake us up and remind us that we should not live according to sin. Maybe he had hope that things would be different. But we know that God is all-knowing. And we know he knows the past, present, and future. Everything we do wrong, he knew that already. Can we really say God was hopeful that people would stop sinning after the flood? Then why would he command us to not kill each other? Why would he give us the Ten Commandments if we would do what's right without being told? Did he not know we would continue to break his laws, continuing to kill and harbor violence in our hearts? Of course he knew. And of course he knows. He knows everything, then why would God promise to protect us from himself? Why would he promise to preserve us when we deserve judgment? Do you still not see the heart of God in his covenant to Noah? Do you not see God's heart for you? God loves us. God will not let us continue in sin unknowingly. His word came to us. God is patient with us even when we don't follow his word. 
And one important thing to realize is that this promise where God will never wipe away humanity again, this promise doesn't mean there won't be judgment at all. Jesus makes that absolutely clear in the New Testament that there will be a final day of judgment where all of us will have to answer for our sins. But that day won't look like the day of the flood where everyone gets what they deserve, which is death, which is eternity in hell. God won't send all of mankind to destruction as he did in the flood. In fact, there will be some, there will be sinners deserving of eternal punishment who will enter into the joy of their creator in heaven. How is this possible? If God is good, how can he send people who are bad to heaven? It makes sense he sends bad people to hell, but how can he send bad people to heaven? And that's where the gospel is good news. It's because of Jesus Christ. Remember Old Testament Israel? Before Jesus, the eternal son of God came on earth, Israelites, they had to continue to give animal sacrifices according to the Mosaic covenant as a substitutionary atonement, as something that takes their place for the punishment of their sins. But once Jesus, the son of man, fully God, fully man, humbly stepped down into space and time, offered himself up as the eternally perfect substitute, we no longer needed to give animal sacrifices. Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified or made holy or saved. In Old Testament Israel, you had to offer up animals for sin offerings in faith. But today, we have a better offering. We have a better sacrifice in Jesus Christ. We don't offer him up. He offers himself up. He did the work. He lived the perfect life. He marched to the cross. He bore your sins. He endured the flood of God's wrath when you deserved it. And all you need to do is trust that Christ's work was for you. Do you see the heart of God? If so, then run to it. If you're a Christian and you feel the burden of guilt and shame for ongoing sins in your life, or you're afraid of your status before God because you have not repented, I wanna remind you of God's mercy and his mercy for you is that you're safe in Jesus. And no matter how much you've sinned, and even if you sinned today or you're sinning right now, your salvation never comes from you. It never came from you. It always comes from trusting in Jesus. And this doesn't mean that your sin doesn't have earthly consequences or that you shouldn't get rid of them because a life of trusting in Jesus is a life of repentance. So take comfort, Christian. Go to God. If you see his heart, go to God. If you don't see the heart of God or it doesn't move you towards him, then let the flood serve as a warning for what will be your fate on the final day of judgment. That sounds serious. And many people think that people of the youth age cannot understand this, but I believe you understand it. And no one else is gonna tell you but the church and the word of God that the flood should serve as a warning for what will be your fate on the final day of judgment. You might think it's cruel or unfair or scary but look at the heart of God. He's been delaying the final judgment so he can save people. He preserved Noah and the rest of creation all the way up until now to delay the final judgment. He's delaying the final judgment 
so that the message of Jesus Christ can be taken to sinners. And this delay has led to the salvation of many and it will continue to lead to the salvation of many others throughout history until Jesus returns. Friend, there is no way to be saved except through hearing and believing in the gospel, through hearing and believing in the message of Jesus that he died for your sins in your place. And today, you've heard the gospel. So do you believe in it? Do you personally trust in Jesus? And if you don't know what that looks like, or you're not sure what a life of repentance looks like, or just instinctively, you just are not sure how to answer that question and you don't wanna lie to yourself. The only thing I can say to you is this. Don't wait to figure it out. Don't wait. Who knows how much time is left? That's the mistake that the people who were swept up by the flood in Noah's day made. They were seeing that he was building an ark. He was telling them a flood was coming, but they didn't listen. They thought they had all the time. As young students, you think you have all the time. You will go to college, you'll get married, you'll have a family, and once you have some downtime then, then you'll figure it out. No, as long as you have today, figure it out, and let's figure it out together. If you're not sure if you personally trust in Jesus, why is that? What are some doubts or questions you have? If something else or someone else looks more desirable than God, why is that? What are you trying to find in them that you are to find ultimately in God? Don't let another moment go by without letting your pastor, your teacher, and your parent know. Notice I didn't say or, I said and because all of us should know so we can pray for you, so we can counsel you, and we can point you to the only one who can save, Jesus Christ. God made an awesome promise that he will not destroy us so that you would have the opportunity to repent, to turn away from sin, and turn back to him. Anytime you sinned what you deserved, is death in that moment, instant death. None of us deserve to be here, but God is withholding his judgment from you for as long as he can so you would hear and believe in the gospel. And that means if you sinned today, you've benefited from this covenant God made to Noah. And if you know you've sinned and you believe there's a judgment coming, only faith in Jesus will save you. Only trusting that his death on the cross was enough to pay for the punishment of your sins will save you. Being a quote unquote good person won't save you. Apologizing to everyone you wronged won't save you. The faith and prayers of your parents won't save you. Coming to church and hearing sermons on a weekly basis and serving, those things won't save you. Only Jesus can save you and he will save you. All you need to do is trust him. In Old Testament times, it was customary for people making covenants to give some sort of sign. And actually, it's not just an Old Testament thing, but we see it today. What's the sign given on a wedding day that marriage couples or married couples are supposed to wear to signal to each other and the world that they will keep their covenant to each other. Wedding rings. If you see someone has a wedding ring on, you know they've made a covenant to someone else until death do them part. A covenant sign like a wedding ring is provided to give confidence that the person making the covenant will keep it. And the sign God chooses to give for the covenant he made to Noah and to us is a rainbow. Look down at verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. 
God gives the rainbow as a sign. Doesn't the rainbow still happen today? That's why God calls the covenant he made with Noah not a momentary covenant or a thousand year covenant. He calls it an everlasting covenant in verse 16. We all know the disappointments of broken promises. We also know what it's like to break promises. So when anyone makes a promise to us, maybe even God, it doesn't give us joy or hope because words are cheap. Instead, promises might bring skepticism or indifference or maybe just your defense mechanism from being disappointed later on. But friend, God is not like anyone else. He is without sin. He is good. He is truthful. He not only makes promises, but he makes the best promises. He not only makes the best promises, but he keeps all of them. And God gave us the sign of the rainbow so that whenever we see it, we can be comforted that he did not forget the covenant he made to Noah. He did not forget the covenant that he made to us. So if you ever doubt the heart of God, may you be reminded of his love and kindness and patience and wisdom displayed in the gospel the next time you see a rainbow. God's covenant to Noah highlights the total depravity or fallenness of mankind. It shows the brokenness and sin of our hearts that are beyond repair. But perhaps with more magnificence, with more glory, the covenant to Noah displays the heart of God for all to see. It displays the heart of God to redeem his creation, to save it, to restore it, to bring it back, to be able to fulfill its purpose. This is a God worth knowing. And this is a God worth worshiping. May we all be found to be true worshipers of the God who made a covenant with Noah. Let's pray.